The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. So our next speaker is Dr. Karin Scrivener from the Laboratory of Materials of Construction at Eco Polytechnic Federal de Luzon. And she's the, the director of that laboratory there and the director of NanoSEM. So thank you, Karin. Thank you, Jason. Okay, so I'm going to present some work of uh, my PhD st student, Theodore Chappé, who um, we started out this project with the idea that we all know supplementary cementitious materials can reduce uh, alkali silica reaction, but the testing methods are not well established. And we thought if we could understand better the mechanisms by which they bring about this reduction, uh, this could be a big help, first of all, in developing test methods, but also perhaps in uh, having a better knowledge of just how much supplementary cementitious materials you need to put into a concrete mix. So you can see we stole the picture from Mike. Um, <laughs> so I think we all know what ASR is. This is a long-term reaction. And I just want to indicate here that this is the kind of aggregates we're working with in Switzerland. Uh, there's a very big problem of ASR. There's about 300 large dams, and about 20% of those are suffering from quite active ASR, with a likelihood they might have to be replaced in the next uh, few years. So it's very important to understand what's going on on. And in these kind of aggregates, we have a lot of non-reactive material with little pockets of reactive material. And you can see how they react, that we get attack along the grain boundaries and um, small amounts of gel that expand the aggregate and then the concrete. This shows uh, results I'll come back to of expansion of mortar bars. This was a test we did with not quite such an aggressive Alkaline content, as Mike looked at, it was only 0.6 molar at 38 degrees C. But the basic idea is that this is the control port and cement. As you add in higher and higher quality, quantities of supplementary cementitious materials, the expansion is very much delayed and reduced. Of course, with this soak solution of alkalis, eventually the alkalis will come in and overwhelm the mitigating effect of the SCM. So, the hypothesis we started out with is that supplementary cementitious materials reduce the alkalinity of the pore solution, and it's been quite well established that the reason they reduce the alkalinity of the pore solution is that we change the composition of the CSH, and then this CSH can absorb more alkali ions. But we wanted to compare what were the effects of supplementary cementitious materials containing only silica compared to ones that contain silica plus alumina. Because there's quite a bit of evidence uh, that supplementary cementitious materials that also claim, uh, contain alumina are much more effective in reducing ASR. And because we wanted to have results quite quickly, we looked at supplementary materials that reacted quickly. We didn't have time for fly ash uh, to react. So we took these systems where on the one hand, we have a replacement of metacaolin, and metacaolin uh, contains roughly equal amounts of sil reactive silica and reactive alumina. And then on the other side here, we have match samples where the amount of silica, this time provided by silica fume, is the same as in the metacaolin. And to make sure we compensate for filler effects of the addition, we just uh, make up the rest of the volume with an inert court filler. So these are our systems, and then we look at these systems, we look at the microstructure, we look at the composition of the CSH, we extract the pore solution, uh, we look at the phase composition, etc. So the first thing was to look at how these additions change the composition 
of the calcium silicate hydrate. And we can do this by taking these point analysis, and what you see here in the systems that just contain silica fume, as we go from the control through to the 5, 10, and 15 percent additions, we move in this direction. We move to higher silicon to calcium ratios, which is the same, of course, as lower calcium to silicon ratios. But in this silica fume system, the alumina content, which is given by this axis here, is staying more or less constant. On the other hand, in the systems where we've got metacaolin, which provides both reactive silica and reactive alumina, you can see we shift the silicon to calcium ratio, but also we get more and more alumina incorporated in our CSH. So we've succeeded in what we set out to do, which is manufacturing systems in which we can engineer the composition of the CSH. And now we want to see, this, do, do these different compositions in CSH, how do they affect the pore solution? So if we look at the pore solution results, we see, as expected, that the, pores, the alkalinity of the pore solution is reduced. This is the control here. This is the 10% addition here, 15% addition here. And, of course, we see that the alkalinity is lower, but quite surprisingly, we saw that the silica fume, this is the addition of only silica, it actually seems to be somewhat more efficient in reducing the pH compared to the metacaolin. So that you see here, even though we've got this extra alumina, which is supposed to be better, we, this is not acting by reducing the pore solution. Now, we wanted to kind of check this effect, we wanted to try and get some measure of how much alkali was being absorbed per gram of CSH. And this was quite difficult to do because it was quite difficult to quantify the amount of CSH. So just on a comparative basis, we took the weight loss up to this point here as being indicative of the amount of CSH in both systems. And the reason we only went up to this temperature here was that we also have this phase, which is Strecklingite, which was interfering with our results in the Illumina system. And when we normalize the results in this way, these are our results. This is the control system. This gives you a measure. As I stress, the, 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 the figures are not absolute. They're comparative. This is the measure of the alkali the absorbed by the CSH. The point is, you see here, is as we put in the substitution, the amount of alkali absorbed per amount of CSH increases, and the results are pretty much the same between the metacaolin systems and the silica fume systems. In fact, we always see the silica fume seems to be more efficient at promoting absorption of alkalis in the CSH. So putting all this together, we came to the conclusion that, well, maybe... Uh, SCMs with alumina are more efficient at reducing ASR, but the way they're doing that is not through the reduction of the pH of the pore solution. So then we took another approach, which is to focus directly on the aggregates. And in the literature, what you can find is that absorption of quite low amounts of alumina on the surface of silica can make a very big difference in its rate of dissolution. So we looked now at our pore solutions again, and this time we looked at the alumina content in solutions. And what we see is that for the more metacaolin we introduce, the more alumina we get into solution. It seems to be quite a transitory effect. It's sort of high here at about 28 days, and then levels off. And the silica fume systems, as we expected, show no measurable alumina in solution. So these kind of concentrations we're getting here in the millimole range, as I said, there have been quite a lot of studies, uh, particularly in marine biology, which have shown these kind of small silicate uh, plankton or whatever. Uh, they dissolve much slower when you have alumina aluminum in solution. So what we did now, well, this is our concrete test before, uh, we're now going on to look at the aggregates just in solutions. I showed you already these results. I showed you that the more substitution we put in, the more we slow down and reduce the reaction. So this is going on now to look at the solutions. 
And the way we measure the degree of reaction with a, with, with a method we published some time ago is a direct method of image analysis of the aggregate. So what you do here, this is just aggregate embedded in a resin, polished. We polish the section, we can pick out the aggregates, and then we can measure the amount of holes and cracks in the aggregate. And of course, you have some holes and cracks there in the first place, but as the reaction goes on, that amount of holes and cracks increases. And here we can see the results. So this is our starting measurement of holes and cracks, and these different lines you see correspond to different amounts of alumina in solution. So this is the control, no alumina in solution, and we see we have pretty high degree of reaction. These are the pictures here. This is the starting condition. This is the end condition, and it's really very easy to see uh, visually how much reaction here the aggregate is almost falling apart. And then down here we have uh, a series where we have different concentrations in solution. It seems that the concentration doesn't matter so much, but what's most effective is this one here, where not only did we put alumina into the solution, but we had a reserve of undissolved aluminum hydroxide, which uh, maintains a continuous supply, and now you can see there's virtually no measurable reaction, and if we look at the corresponding images, you can see the same thing. The aggregate here is just about in the same state as it was in the beginning. So here we have direct proof that uh, the aluminium in solution can act directly to suppress the dissolution of reactive silicates in aggregates. So the final step of the investigation was to look at fused silica plates. So you can buy these uh, plates of fused silica, and this is quite a nice setup because you can investigate it with quite sophisticated techniques of uh, photoelectron spectroscopy. I'm not going to go into the details of the results because, unfortunately, there isn't time. But um, we could measure that the amount of alumina absorbed on the surface, increased with time, and we can see also that the amount of alumina absorbed on the surface increases when the pH is lower. So this indicates that in a real concrete, we have a conjunction of two effects. First of all, we need to bring down the pH, which is done by the reactive silica, but by bringing down the pH, we enhance this effect of absorption of the alumina on the surface, which in turn suppresses the reaction. And you can find the kind of mechanisms by which it's proposed this dissolution is slowed down in the literature. Again, I'm not going to go into these in too much detail. We will present this paper in more detail at the ICAR conference. So finally, I just want to show this rather nice test where we can see in one and the same specimen very graphically the effect of aluminium in solution. So what we had here, we had this disc, and first of all, we treated half the disc by a pretreatment in a solution that contained alumina. Okay, so it had 90 days immersion in this solution with 30 millimoles of alumina, just half the disc. And then we took the disc out of that solution, we turned it round, and by turning it round, we then immersed this other half in alkali solution. So we've now got four different conditions. We've got the condition at the top, which is the before state. We've got the condition at the bottom, which is the state after immersion in alkali. And on the right, we've got the ones that have seen alumina. On the left, we've got the untreated sample. And when we then look at this, this is what we see, and I think this demonstrates very, very visually the effect of alumina. Here's the original fused silica surface, and that fused silica surface with no pretreatment after immersion in alkalis, it's very easy to see the very heavy etching of that surface, that that silica is dissolving and in a concrete would lead to alkali silica reaction. Here on the other side, we see that the pretreatment in alumina, we can't see any visual effects, we wouldn't expect to, but now when this material here is dispersed in the alkali solution, you see it really just stays the same. There's absolutely no dissolution of the silica. So this leads us to our conclusions that the 
action of alumina containing SEMs is not by a further reduction of the alkalinity of the system, it's by direct incorporation of of alumina ions on the silica surface, which act directly to slow down the reaction. And I think this finding can really be quite important because we can now think of different concepts to uh, reduce ASR. So, for example, if you have a very fast-reacting aggregate, it may be important to have a source of uh, aluminium in the system very early on, perhaps to add something like metakaolin, which reacts very rapidly to give alumina, perhaps backed up with fly ash, which will give you a reserve of reactive alumina over the long time. And by understanding these mechanisms, I think this should lead us to be able to more efficiently design concretes which can combat ASR, particularly in situations like dams where you're really forced to use the aggregates that's in place. You don't have the option to ship in non-reactive aggregates from elsewhere. So thank you very much. And if you've got any questions, I'll try to answer them at this time. Thank you.